Well, we do have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? I see some people right now who remind me of how thankful we should be. So, um, And I know we have uh, our friends and fellow members of the body listening on live stream. I know that because they've told me. So uh, we certainly hope we get to, and we pray that we get to the place where uh, you can be back with us. I'm looking that way because that's where the camera is. But uh, that is certainly our prayer, it, that the Lord will uh, rid us um, in, in, in great portion of this uh, virus and we can all be back physically uh, together. But we certainly understand those that do not come. Uh, that's totally understandable, and uh, we look forward to the day that you can come and be back with us. But it's so great to see you uh, here in the building. Uh, that's an encouragement to the teacher, isn't it? Um, and um, so I hope, you, hope you, as Warren said, I hope you had a, a, a good Thanksgiving. Well, we've arrived at the second half of uh, Matthew chapter 6, so please... Uh, turn there, and I will too. It is a very familiar and quite convicting half chapter that speaks to two of the most vexing challenges the follower of Jesus Christ faces. Uh, the competing pleasures the world has to offer, and related to that, the worry and anxiety that so easily overwhelms us when we begin to believe we may not get as much of it as we would like. I was tempted to treat all 16 verses in one lesson, but I will not. And you can determine whether I chose not to, because that would have been too much work. As in, uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said, I sat down to write you a short letter, but I wrote a long one instead because I didn't have enough time. <laughs> or uh, whether it was because each of these sections is uh, so treacherous and prevalent that they deserve their own spot spotlight. But we'll read and study only the first six verses this morning that have to do with the competing pleasures of the world as compared to what has true value. And you'll forgive me, I hope, but I am sort of taunting ourselves with the title of the lesson, uh, where is your treasure? So beginning in verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for he, he will either hate the one and love the other. And I'll just pause just for a second that we see this kind of language uh, in our New Testaments. It's more like a figure of speech. Hate as compared with uh, the alternative, which is much uh, more loving. So in comparison to one, you could call this hate. And Jesus uh, talked about if you don't hate your father and your mother, of course, he, he believed you should honor your father and your mother. What he was trying to say, that the Lord Jesus should have primacy in your life. So the last verse, verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, or as you know, mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. 
Well, I find it a wonderful providence that this lesson follows so closely after Dan's sermon out of the book of Joshua, chronicling the sin of Achan. You have to think back only a few weeks to that episode in Joshua chapter 7, in which Achan's sin led to Israel's defeat by the armies of Ai. His sin was in direct disobedience to the Lord's explicit command to Israel not to take any of the possessions of the defeated city of Jericho, but instead to leave them under the ban. But we recognize Achan's sin was also very much along the lines of what Jesus warns against in our passage this morning. Don't lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. There is a greater treasure to be found in fidelity to the Lord God. But Achan rejected that devotion and instead, well, he confessed it in Joshua 7, 21. I saw those beautiful material things they discovered in the residences of Jericho. I saw them. I coveted them. I took them. I looked there in my tent with the silver. As we age, we like to talk about things like finishing well. Uh, Achan did not finish well. Neither did Adam and Eve. Uh, there in the garden, they had everything they could possibly want or need, but there was that one tree and Genesis 3 describes how Eve saw that the fruit was good and it was desirable. And then she took it and she ate it. And the result was disastrous. Now, those are two fairly ancient examples to start our lesson, but we really haven't advanced much past the snares that caused them to fall. Just as the lust of the eyes and the attractions of the world led them astray, they would later turn the hearts of Israel away from the Lord to serve the idols of men. And today, you and I are tempted too by the glittering, seductive, siren call of things which have stolen our devotion and, and plunged many into a desperate and relentless race to obtain the good life. It's not a downfall of any one generation, but a reflection of the human heart. And it is as Augustine famously wrote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Well, here in the Sermon on the Mount, we find Jesus challenging his followers to examine where their hearts are reside. He begins with the negative injunction in verse 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. I think we are by nature treasure seekers. Uh, who of us cannot say that when we were children, at least, we were fascinated with the idea of searching for treasure. Perhaps it was books like Treasure Island or, or stories of pirates uh, burying the treasure chest on an island and drawing out a map where X marks the spot. Uh, didn't we imagine what it would be like to, open, to find and open up that treasure chest uh, full of, of gold coins, jewelry, and doubloons. The issue the Lord raises here is not whether or not we will seek after treasure. That's assumed. He speaks of treasure in order to draw our attention to what we prize above all else. The issue is what kind of treasure is worthy of our pursuit and of storing up for ourselves. And he exhorts us, you see here, both negatively and positively. Here in verse 19, he states negatively that we are to not store up treasures for ourselves on earth. For he says, where he says they'll be liable to loss. Everything on this planet, 
including ourselves, is continually liable to loss. This body is on a downhill slide. Uh, despite sporadic, and I mean sporadic, attempts to reverse it. And our most prized things, our possessions, are right now as pristine as they ever will be because they're rotting before our very eyes. The food and drink are spoiling, the house is shifting, the pavement cracking, the jewelry stolen or lost or gone out of style. Life was a little more simple in ancient times. The three great sources of wealth were clothes, especially uh, fine garments, the basic food sources like corn and grain, and gold or other precious metals. And what Jesus is stating is the obvious. Earthly treasures are not durable. There is no permanence to them. In those days, one could not protect clothing from the infestation of moths that ate away at them and destroyed their beauty and value. Uh, this word translated rust actually means something like eating away. And that is what threatened the stored grain. Rats, mice, other vermin attacked and destroyed that source of wealth. And whatever precious metals one owned uh, were subject to thieves and robbers who only needed to dig holes into the clay and mud walls of people's houses to steal them and deprive the owners of that wealth. But of course, the Lord was not broadly condemning possessions in and of themselves. He's not saying at all that it is inherently wrong to own things. Uh, that is a right uh, accepted, uh, presupposed throughout uh, the Bible. The very idea behind the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, is that certain things belong to people and you're not, you're not to take them from them without their permission, and nor are they to take your poss possessions from you. And what was it that Peter said to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 when those two had secretly held back a sum of money uh, out of their gift to the church, Peter charged Ananias, while the land remained unsold, did it not remain your own? It was yours. It belonged to you. And he continued, and after it was sold, was it not under your control? Their sin, Ananias and Sapphira's, was not having possessions, but in lying about their own generosity. And never did the Lord suggest that a person not not to be the kind of steward of his financial means that he would not wisely preserve some for future needs or in order to leave something behind for his heirs. He actually encouraged labor for profit. And later his apostles insisted that if a man would not work and so earn money to take care of his family, he shouldn't be allowed to mooch off of others because he'd been lazy. Uh, he shouldn't be allowed to go begging to others in order to feed himself. He's worse than an unbeliever, the apostle said. The wisdom that we gain from the scriptures is that we ought to look to the noble ant. He works, and then he lays aside some of his gains so that he might draw from it in the future. No, what Jesus is pointing to is the kind of selfish accumulation of worldly goods that amounts to avarice, of what one commentator labeled worldly mindedness. Lay up not for yourselves treasure on earth, Jesus said. It's not good stewardship, he condemns, but covetousness. It's not the amount of money accumulated, but the attitude one has toward it. It is, as the Apostle Paul advised Timothy, the love of money that is the root of all evil. What is it that brings you the most satisfaction in life? Well, now, certainly for some, 
it is the accumulation of riches, of money, and all that riches can buy. But he's equally, the Lord is equally pointing us to the other types of earthly treasures that can dominate our time and, and our energy. It is an easy thing, for example, to fall into a pattern of living in which we wake up one day and realize that our children have become our idols. Our position in our company, uh, the power we've accumulated, or our reputation, or what kind of house or houses we live in, or the luxurious travel that we indulge in. All these things we discover are, are fleeting, and even after having obtained them, we eventually come to the sad realization that they'll not belong to us forever, but when we die, we'll carry with us exactly what we brought into the world, nothing. You've made, you've heard me quote more than once or twice that little statement the old sports writer Blackie Sherrod made about money. Money can't buy happiness, he said, but it sure can rent it for a while. We all know what Blackie meant by that. All things being equal, we'd rather have a little money than not. But the better illustration is one Dr. Waltke shared years ago about the ambitious businessman who was startled by the appearance of an angel in a vision who offered to give him any one thing he desired and would ask for. And this man, being a savvy investor, thought for a moment, and he replied that he'd like to have a copy of the stock exchange page of the Wall Street Journal one year from the day. Well, promptly, uh, the angel handed it to him, and he was ecstatic. He had now a plan to gain treasure beyond his wildest imaginations. And, but as his eyes scanned the page, he inadvertently glanced across to the opposite page where he saw a picture of himself in the obituary section. Dr. Walkie said the man quickly lost all interest in the stock market. It's a bit of a modern day version of the parable Jesus told in Luke chapter 12 about the rich man who was very productive and who began to fret about uh, what he would do to store all his crops that were coming in. Now you know this story and you know that he reasoned that, well, he'd just build bigger barns uh, to hold all the surplus grain that was going to be his. And then he put his feet up and he said something like this to himself, you've got it made. Uh, you've got uh, all you need for years and years, so take it easy, and as the saying goes, eat, drink, and be merry. But God, that's how Jesus related the parable, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now there, in that statement, is both the negative exhortation and the positive in one stroke. Do not store up treasures on earth. Be rich toward God. Are you rich toward God? Are you rich toward God? That's really the same question as we see there implied in verse 20. Are you stor storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven? If treasure on earth is liable to loss, then treasure in heaven is the riches we will never lose or forfeit. One is earthly and only for a brief time. The other heavenly and will last forever. It's hard for us mortals to think in those terms, that we could be gathering up treasures that would last forever. Especially when we think of our earthly treasures and we look back on them fondly, perhaps. A, a car we bought, <laughs> a, a shirt we liked, a, uh, a piece of jewelry. Where is it? It's gone. 
Well, in the context of our sermon, let's not forget that. This is the Sermon on the Mount, and it has different elements we've been studying. So in, this, in the context of this sermon, uh, this storing up uh, must refer to the things we do here on this earth, which are done as unto our Father. Remember, Jesus said, pray uh, our Father. So these are things we do uh, as unto our Father in whose presence, we've talked about living our lives in the presence of God, in whose presence we're actors in a a heavenly drama. It's the things we do that last for eternity. It's living the Beatitudes, not just knowing what they are, but living them. That's the hard part. Praying the sincere prayer, uh, growing in our knowledge of Christ and exercising the spiritual gifts, not just knowing that perhaps we have a a spiritual gift, but exercising the spiritual gifts we've received. It would include anonymously helping those in need, but also giving money to support the ministry of the gospel. It's living kingdom-minded lives with a mind to make disciples and thus invest in eternity. It would be conduct resembling Moses. Moses who forsook the ease of a privileged life in Egypt to follow the Lord, and as the author of Hebrews put it, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. And what about the treasures themselves? We've talked about what the storing up is. What about the treasures themselves? themselves. Well, this would be of the imperishable variety. They would consist of the divine approval when we enter into the eternal wonder of God's kingdom. And as Paul described in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Lord will bring to light all of the motives of our hearts, and each man's praise will come to him from God. How wonderful will that be? The treasures will include the glorious wonder of the new heavens and the new earth, which the scriptures describe in glimpses couched in glittering metaphor because mere human expression cannot approach the grandeur of it all, what we have to face and experience one day. They will be the absence of sin, productive work without thorns, without frustration, love and companionship, pure and unselfish, and an abundance of the hunger and thirst for righteousness that the Beatitudes speak to that will never be frustrated, but instead be every moment's deepest desire to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Above all, our treasure in heaven will be the perfect fellowship we will enjoy with our glorious Savior, one that will never end. But there is a connection between what a person desires and what he is storing up. And so in verse 21, we have the Lord's logical summation of the matter. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The truth of that is so obvious. Our heart always follows what we treasure. I'm a simple guy, you know that. There's one college football team that is a sit down for me. I told someone earlier this week, they asked me, are you gonna watch that game? I said, I I don't miss that game. If they're playing, I'm watching. Your heart always follows what what you treasure. That's why if we honestly ask ourselves the question, where is my heart? All we have to do is follow our treasurer. Where, where do we spend our time? Uh, where do we direct our energies? What occupies our thoughts? Today's technology companies have learned that. It's part of the key to their phenomenal success. They know how to track our treasure. And then they feed it back to us. It's an ongoing cycle. If you treasure financial gain, they'll feed you financial advice. 
If you're absorbed in sports, you'll get more opportunities for more sports. If it's knitting, you'll be flooded with offers for knitting stuff. Whether it's hunting or dogs or politics or video games, the tech companies will know it and they will appeal to your heart because they know where it is. They know where our hearts are. You know, at Christmas or on birthdays or anniversaries, we exchange gifts typically. And they're often wrapped in paper. My gifts are not always wrapped in paper. <laughs> Hers are, but uh, they're wrapped in paper so that we can't discover what is in the gift until we remove the wrapping paper. And that's what these companies do. They unwrap our habits and our lust and where we spend our time and they find our heart and they feed it. There's a unusual restaurant in Dallas called Cafe Momentum. It really is an admirable enterprise. It's a very good restaurant. It's more than a restaurant. It's a, it's a mission because it employs uh, underprivileged and troubled young people and it trains them and gives them responsibilities and accountability that pulls many of them out of a downward trajectory to put them on a path to productive lives. Cindy and I went there a couple of weeks ago. It's a great restaurant. Well, they produced a brochure uh, featuring a, a smiling young man on the cover and this motto in bold print. The things we think about, focus on, and surround ourselves with will shape who we become. Now that's not my message, I like that slogan, and I agree with it, but the flip side of it is also true. The things we think about, focus on, and surround ourselves will reveal where our treasure is. Colossians 3 verse 1, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And that's where the imperishable treasure is to be found. So another question, where is your treasure? The last verses of our passage, verses 22 through 24, contain the, the, the two illustrations the Lord then gave of the single-minded devotion the follower of Jesus must have. The first is the clear eye or single eye. Uh, the second is the illustration of the single service. And together they serve to emphasize from two different angles the importance of single-minded devotion to setting God aside in our hearts to the exclusion of rivals. But the second illustration, verse 24, is clear on the face of it. The first, not so much, but I would hope we can get the gist of it. It's, it's, it's difficult because of two things. Number one, the meaning of this Greek word haplous, uh, translated variously as single or good, or as in my translation, as clear. And then just to add on, the editors of my Bible in the margin suggest something like healthy, sincere, you can tell people are struggling. What does this word uh, mean? The other challenge in the verse is simply understanding the meaning of the verse. But if we let the opening line govern the meaning, I think we come closest to its thought. The eye, Jesus says, is the lamp of the body. The eye is the lamp of the body. So we picture one's body as a room. And the eye is the window that lets in the light and so serves as a kind of lamp. The season that we're in uh, really serves us well here, I think. In the middle of our hot Texas summers, uh, there's plenty of light, arguably too much light. And so that at times we actually want to pull the shades down on our windows in order to reduce the amount of light. But in the autumn, 
as the days shorten and the cooler air comes in, we tend to want the windows uncovered as, as long as we can in order to enjoy as much of the light and warmth of the sun as possible. In Jesus' day, philosophers believed that the eye was a kind of window into the heart, a window into one's soul. And light, always, of course, is a symbol in the Bible uh, for what is good and, and wholesome as opposed to darkness, uh, which is an apt metaphor for evil, uh, or in this case, a lack of devotion to God. But forgetting for a moment shades and blinds and, or, or drapes, how nice it is to have clear, bright windows that allow the light to come in and illumine the rooms of our home, or in this case, the rooms of our soul, and allow us to see clearly and go about our business being productive and enjoying the two-way communion with our Lord that is the ideal for the disciple of Christ. And so the interpretation must be, as, as William Barclay suggested, that the light which gets into any man or woman's heart and soul and being depends on the spiritual state of the eye through which it has to pass. For the eye is the window of the whole body. But what if the window itself is not the single, clear, good window one would desire. Why then, as Jesus says, your whole body will be full of darkness. Such a person is the one, we know these people, don't we? Perhaps it's you right now, I hope not. But we know these people, such a person is the one who has no such singleness of purpose, but a dimmed vision of what surrounds him. Every decision he makes is handicapped by the darkness of his heart. And as the Lord plaintively states, how great can the darkness be that envelops such a stumbling soul? He'll inevitably get lost seeking hidden worldly treasures he'll never find handicapped by a woeful lack of vision. It's a sad thing. The second illustration is clearer, the two masters, and it will help us as we read it again to recognize that by masters, Jesus is not uh, bringing before us a category such as our modern day employers, you know, who we work for, uh, but rather slave masters. That's, that's what Jesus was talking about, slave masters. In today's world, it actually is possible to serve two employers. So, some of you may be serving three right now. You're working hard uh, to, to meet your needs and to provide. But in the ancient world, you could, one could only have one master. So he says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters, two slave masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The Lord is describing a situation here in which a man, against all odds, is attempting to go through life serving two different mas masters, which he says is not possible. He doesn't suggest that a person may not try to serve two masters. Indeed, you get the idea here from the very fact that he mentions it, that it is actually a quite common practice for someone to try to serve two masters. And what happens when a man does attempt this, Jesus states, is that inevitably only one receives his affections and attention. Only one really enjoys his service. Inevitably, there will be a conflict between the two. And that's when allegiances get sorted out and only one will come out the winner, whom we wish to serve most will surface. 
And the Lord seems to sum up the painful choice by identifying the competing masters as either God or mammon. Mammon being the transliteration of an Aramaic word that, without going into great detail, but reducing it to its basic meaning stands for money or the material wherewithal that we trust in for our overall welfare. That's what mammon is. But the Lord insists that no person can serve two masters. No one can serve both God and mammon. Many would disagree with that. They think they can serve the Lord just a little bit here and a little bit there and also reserve devotion to, to riches, to mammon. But they misunderstand the commanding nature of the service to which our Lord calls us. And they misunderstand what the words can and cannot mean. They refer to ability. When the Lord says you cannot serve God and wealth, he means you're not able to. It's, you don't have the ability to do that. And this is the problem today for many, is it not? They think they can. And so we see today very commonly in our evangelical circles, especially in our country, professing Christians going through the motions of serving God, going to church, serving on the committee, uh, taking the kids to Sunday school. But <clears throat> what devours the majority of their thoughts, their time, their gifts and energies is the desire for mammon and all that's implied in that word. There are so many pleasures and allurements that tempt us in our affluent society. We all feel the tug of them. You do, I do. My parents used to speak of keeping up with the Joneses. Some of you still say that. Uh, I bet everybody in this room knows that saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Well, that plague is still with us today. It's covetousness that afflicts us, and covetousness is idolatry. So the Lord is asking us, I believe, who is your master? Whom are you serving? What is it that your eyes are fixed upon? Dr. Carson, Donald Carson, illustrated this by describing a large field of fresh new snow glistening in the winter sun in his native Canada. You have to picture this, large field, freshly fallen snow, a white sheet. There's no mark in it, no footprint. Yours is the privilege, he said, of tramping across it and establishing any pattern you like. If you look fixedly at your feet and, and try to cross the field in a straight line, you'll make a very erratic uh, pattern. If instead you fix your eyes on a tree on the horizon and keep focused on that tree and walk across that field of snow, uh, the path you leave will be remarkably straight. The point of the illustration clearly, is that we tend to move <clears throat> toward the object on which we fix our gaze, our gaze. So if we want to answer the question, uh, who is our master? All we need to do is examine what we have fixed our gaze upon. There is our master. It's true. So the two parts of the passage this morning conspire to teach the same lesson. It's a message for everyone, for a pastor teacher, an elder, a deacon, uh, a, a college student, a, a young adult, uh, the young family leader. We can't forever go through life being double-minded. Instead, we must cultivate a singleness of purpose, a heart solely devoted to God, a response 
which springs from a heart grateful for the incredible blessings God has bestowed and for the remarkable promises, the fulfillment for which we await. Our hearts can be found where our treasures reside. The clear and good eye is the one fixed on God, unwavering in its gaze, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You know that verse, we run the only race that matters, seeking the only reward that will last forever, the only treasure worthy of forsaking all else, he whose glory and beauty are above all else. So let that be our daily prayer. Uh, let us not waste our lives. Father, that's what we pray, uh, that we would uh, be singular in purpose, uh, that the object of our purpose, the treasure seeking we're employed in, uh, will be oriented only toward knowing you and serving you and enjoying you. Uh, Father, what a tragedy to waste our lives pursuing things that cannot last and really cannot give us the, the desire that's deepest in our heart. So we ask, Lord, that the spiritual disciplines that you give to us that assist us in that, a prayer and Bible study and the fellowship of the saints as we are enjoying right now, that we would engage in them and that you would enable us. We can't do this on our own. On our own, our affections wander. They get distracted by this world. So, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to give glory to you as we live our lives in your presence, but also in the presence of the unbelieving world and they see the things that we're attracted to and wonder why and want to know how our treasure can be theirs also. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.